What if I told you there are website owners like you and I that generate over a million clicks to their websites per month and none of these come from Google? How much less stress would you endure when Google releases yet another core update if you had that much traffic from another platform? I'll reveal the platform that Tony is using to generate 1 million clicks per month in a minute, but first let me set the stage for this episode. By the way, welcome to the Authority Hacker Podcast. My name is Gail Bratton. I'm one of the co-founders of Authority Hacker, where with Mark, my business partner, we've helped over 12,000 students successfully start their own authority sites. So with all the crazy AI changes that Google has announced coming to search, I think the SEO industry has gone through the five stages of grief and we're finally at the last stage, acceptance. We all realize that SEO is really far from that and it's still by far the best traffic source for a website, but we also understand that we're probably going to get a little bit less traffic in the future from search. And I don't know about you, but this made me think about expanding our traffic sources. Being fully dependent on Google or any other platform for that matter is a sure way to a rocky future as platform changes are inevitable. But when you look around at other platforms, it's quite difficult to decide where to spend your time. Do you want to spend time on TikTok? Do you want to spend time on Instagram? Do you want to spend time on Twitter? Do you want to spend time on LinkedIn? Well, let me tell you, as a publisher, they're not all worth your time. And that's exactly why we put this episode together. To help those of you that want to diversify their traffic sources, pick the best platform and have the highest chances of success. In the case of Tony, it's actually Pinterest that drives 1 million clicks per month to his website. And I'm really curious about his strategy and how exactly he does it. So we're thinking of inviting him on the podcast. I just want to know what you think. So let me know in the comments if we should invite him to talk about his strategy here on the Authority Hacker Podcast. But depending on your niche and your business model, another platform may be better than Pinterest. And that's exactly what we're going to be uncovering in this episode. But before we get started, don't forget to like and subscribe. This helps us grow our secondary traffic sources. So that would be really appreciated. Anyway, enough talking. Let's get started with the episode. Hey everyone, welcome to the Authority Hacker Podcast. In today's episode, we are going to be talking about 11 alternative traffic sources that you can leverage to not fully rely on Google in these uncertain times where AI is rising and people might be worried that you know some organic traffic might drop. That being said, and I'm going to say it right away uh, in the podcast to not care among people, I still think that SEO is and will be the best traffic source for most website owners. And I think that even if the traffic dropped, let's say 50%, there will still be a strong case for SEO being the best case, the best traffic source. And so that's something that you should definitely not drop and think of like going for after one of these traffic sources, but rather see all of these as alternative slash secondary ways of acquiring traffic to your site, but also, you know, grow your EEAT and reputation in a niche, for example, that could eventually lead to getting a bunch of like high quality links you would not necessarily get through outreach that eventually makes tr Google trust your site more. So see these as more like alternatives and ways to protect yourself from bad Google updates, for example. But before we talk about all of these, obviously, we're going to go through the traditional, how's it going, Mark? It's going good. Yeah. And uh, researching this podcast, just been trolling through all the different social media platforms and ending up in a bunch of doom scrolling scenarios. I know. So, yeah. I did TikTok. So <laughs> <laughs> I did TikTok and I was like, <laughs> and I was like, that's why I don't have this app. Um, I have it on my browser for Authority Hacker, but I don't have it on my phone. Normally, I think it's a, it's a safe bet. And it, I think that's one of the things as well. It's like when we work on social media, when social media is your work, it's like you find yourself wasting lots of time uh, and it's it's not very fun. But overall, like uh, researching this was quite interesting. Uh, we do use some of these firsthand. So we'll be able to talk more firsthand on some of these things. Some of these things uh, we don't run firsthand and we'll be honest about it. We'll tell you, but we still have like looked at some examples, researched, etc. So still going to be interesting, but yeah, want to be fully upfront with people. Before we jump into this though, I want talk about the relationship between the business model of a site and the traffic sources because you know when you read generic advice like I see several people in the industry be like oh just diversify your traffic diversify your traffic etc the truth is it's not always a good idea and and it's like the example is the traditional affiliate review site right you need buying intent behind your traffic. It's not just the va the visits on your site. It's like you make money when someone clicks on one of your links, like reads the content, clicks on one of the links, then buys, uh, and then maybe you make money. And so if you just get random traffic that's doom scrolling on social media, for example, to a site like that, the chances of them randomly doom scrolling, clicking on your link, reading the content saying, yes, I'm buying this based on that review, clicking and buying is so much lower than someone who intentionally searched on Google like our oh, best uh, paintball protection and then is going to a paintball game soon. Clarified that to Google by typing this search 
and then eventually lands on the site that matches exactly what they are looking for at this moment, clicks and buys. And so, for example, traditional review sites, you will see that there is some options to use some of these, but if you are just reviewing and nothing else, there's not going to be that many alternatives, and usually your best bet is to focus on getting better at SEO rather than you know growing many, many of these sources with the exception of one or, or two. Or changing your business model slightly. Yeah, or evolving your business model, and we have a podcast about that, so... So you can click on the card here if you want to check out the podcast on that, where we talk about evolving the business model, which is going to open up new traffic sources and allow you to expand and essentially build a more stable business that doesn't just rely on ranking well on Google, like a lot of just only review sites are. So for example, if you run ads, it's a bit different, right? Because it's like you make money by people viewing your pages. So the only condition you have to these platforms is that they drive enough traffic to your site so it's viable. So some platforms don't drive much traffic, and we'll talk about that. Some platforms can drive good traffic, and they are viable for ad sites. And that's why people who implement ads on their site quite often open up new traffic sources that uh, become interesting to them. And, and you know, a lot of people in the industry, for example, talk about Facebook pages recently, and we'll talk about this when we talk about Facebook. Uh, I have some rant about that, so we'll see about that. Um, but yeah, that's basically it. And then when you have your own products, then you can run everything. You can run paid traffic because it's much easier to be profitable on paid traffic with your own products than it is with affiliates, for example, uh, or ads, it's pretty much impossible, very difficult. Uh, you can have affiliates that you only pay when they make you money, so you can really never lose money on that and overall one one kind of like benefit of like having your own product is that uh, because you have higher profit margins you tend to have the money to pay people to run these other platforms uh, whereas when you're like more of a solopreneur affiliate etc while this sometimes may be a good idea the resource constraints make it unviable and so like that's one of the things that uh, what well, we recommend people evolve their business model all the way to having their own products so that they can actually do that. Basically. And that, that that's really important because it's quite hard to manage 10 business. different yeah. platforms. It's not simply a case of you make a blog post, put it on your site, and then repost that on all these other th other social networks, it's right? pretty shit to do you that, You need yeah. to create content that's like specific for each one and like the formats are all different. The culture of each one is is very different and what works on one is just not going to work on the other. So it's just a lot of work to, to do that. Yeah, and it's it's also like a mental rewiring. Like, And we're, let's just jump into the pl first platform because there's a bit of that in there. Uh, and the first platform is basically YouTube. So I think it's the goat of social media for me. It's like, you know, it's like the, if you, there was a S tier to F tier of, uh, of uh, social platforms, I would say YouTube's probably... Uh, the GOAT, not necessarily because it drives the most traffic, so like as an ad site, I probably wouldn't bother too much, although you could just make videos and make revenue from AdSense and selling sponsorships maybe. Um, but uh, just because overall the amount of reach you have, like it's the second biggest search engine in the world that is also featured in the first search engine in the world and the fourth search engine, which is Bing in the world. Third one, I think, is Amazon. Um, so it's like, it gives you an idea of like how much reach you can get by creating these YouTube videos, and it works really well. But as, the, as you raised, it's like creating content on YouTube is so different than creating content on Google. Uh, and I, I'm going to jump right away to the example because I think it's a perfect example of a site that uh, does that. And that, that's security.org, right? So security.org, probably one of the last remaining VPN sites that kind of like ranks quite well for VPN queries and all these things. They, according to Ahrefs, they have 1.5 million organic traffic. Uh, I don't know how much I trust Ahrefs numbers these days, but you know, it's still a site that gets a, a good amount of traffic. And then you check them on YouTube, they have made a fair attempt at YouTube. They have 572 views on their latest YouTube video. And that's, that's a little sad, you know? <laughs> uh, that's pretty bad. Why? because they create content like they create SEO content. Uh, the last uh, YouTube video that they have, it's digital security tools, right? So it's like, first of all, they, they didn't put how many tools. Like the way they do their title is like very, it's an SEO keyword. <laughs> and then it's like, uh, so it's like the clicks through it, pretty bad. The thumbnail is pretty decent, but again, they really miss the number here. It's like the easy win here. Uh, nine digital security tools or like, you know, scare people. Like if it's security, it's like, oh my God, don't get your data stolen or something like this. Uh, and they haven't gone into that, but also in the structure of their content, um, they, they, for example, they talk about VPN at the beginning and the first section that's like a minute is what is a VPN? And it's like exactly what you would do in an SEO article, right? You would 
define these things because you need to measure that search intent and you need to hit all these things. But on a YouTube video, people are like, fuck, I already know, like NordVPN is already sponsoring all the videos. Of course I know what is a VPN. Uh, every time I open a YouTube video, I'm reminded of that. This, uh, and this kind of reminds me of <laughs> well, almost like what we did in the early days, like you just use YouTube as a platform video hosting, to host yeah. videos that are gonna go in your article. So that's probably why they're mentioning what is a VPN at the start of, of that. Video. Yeah, but do you do, if it's already on the page, why do you need it in the video? Like the video should complement what's on the page, not repeat it. And it's like, uh, even if you're using it that way, it doesn't work. I think they're much better off making an engaging video embedded in an SEO article, uh, which is uh, what we're going for on the Toy Hacker right now, for example. We're kind of going for a mix where we uh, make videos that are optimized for the platform, but embed them into blog posts that are optimized for SEO so that we can increase our time on page while at the same time do quite decently on the platform itself, right? Um, so I, I thought this example was perfect because it shows the, like, the, the, the fallacy that a lot of site owners have when they start on YouTube and, and why they fail for a lot of people. Um, now, I've said a lot of great things about YouTube and it's very strong, for example, if you want to show EAT as well because you, know, you usually tend to have the product or something like this. Uh, you can build an email list very easily with YouTube actually I think it would be released at this point, like my uh, YouTube video on automating uh, AI has lead magnets built in, et cetera, and call to actions, et cetera. And I'm, it hasn't been released yet, but I'm, I'm expecting it will do quite okay in terms of opt-ins. And it's like, you really have the opportunity to grow a real following. Like, you know, on the, on the site, when you rank, you know, people click, they read your content, they click on the affiliate link or whatever, and they forget about you, and they don't care unless they opt into your email list. But on YouTube, people actually will follow you, etc. That will increase, for example, your brand searches. That you know is a really strong indicator to Google that actually people care about your brand and so on. So, really, really powerful. But with all these great things comes great pain, <laughs> and that is all the downside of running YouTube, which there are a lot. The first one is it's very competitive. A lot of people have identified it's probably the best platform to be on social. And therefore, there are a lot of people creating content on YouTube. And in a lot of industries now, the standard of production is pretty high and it can be intimidating if you have never made a video. And I think that's what's preventing a lot of people from starting. But it doesn't have to be the case. It's like uh, I, there, there are a lot of like kind of like underground channels that tend to do well as well when they get started, when they have a fresh angle. Example, in our industry, like uh, there are a lot of people who talk about mass scaling AI content and, and basically spamming with AI. I don't like it, but I, I see the views they're making on YouTube, like uh, income, uh, income stream surfer, etc., stuff like that. They're doing really well. And it's like, it shows they have zero production value. Sometimes the videos are barely edited, etc. Still, quite often, very often, they beat our views most of the time, really. Um, and so like that shows uh, that you can come into a uh, fairly competitive niche and actually do quite okay, provided you have a fresh angle. Uh, so I think that's not something that should scare you, but it can be intimidating when you get started. The second is that you need to get out there, right? It's like, you know, when you write a blog post, you can just like, you know, not shave like I do when I do the podcast. <laughs> um, just uh, write your blog post, nobody's gonna bother about you, drink your coffee, etc. and nobody cares. But when you do YouTube, like you need to put your personality out there. You need to show some personality as well. Like if you're, if you're bland in your, when you express yourself, you're not going to do so well. Uh, so you, you, it's kind of like a new skill to learn. Why are you, why are you smiling? I'm just thinking, aren't we quite bland? Or are we? Or do we have personality? I don't know. Talk for <laughs> yourself. I'm good, you know? Uh, but but um, the thing as well is like when you do that, it's like let's say you express your personality, you manage to build an audience, etc. It's very hard to pass that on. Uh, and the biggest creators on YouTube cannot pass their channel. Like Mr. Beast will always have to be in Mr. Beast videos. MKBHD will always have to be in MKBHD videos, even though they have hundreds of staff. Uh, Linus Tech Tips as well, like hundreds of staff, etc. He has to be in a lot. He's not in all videos, but he has to be in a lot of the videos because that's what works. He literally stepped down as CEO to become full-time creator for his own channel while putting someone else as a CEO, for example, which is a very interesting uh, thing to observe that like the creators have become employees of their, own, <laughs> of their own company because that's the way the company is gonna grow the fastest. It's a treadmill, YouTube. Uh, yeah. Much, much more, I mean, SEO is to an extent, you know, if you don't update your content, it's good, it it's gonna more, tank. Yeah. But YouTube and all these social networks are much, much more the, the, that case. And if you're not constantly producing new content regularly, then you just fall apart, you know? And if you try and get other people to come and do it, like 
that guy Ray well. William Johnson many years ago. Uh, I saw he he's got, kind of back he now, fucked, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like big, big mistake there. There's um, another channel, Legal Eagle, as well. So a couple million sub subscribers uh, tried to do the same, and I'm not sure if they're still trying. But you just notice straight away that engagement goes way down when you do it. Yeah, it's just it's you have to stay there. Like it's like now we're starting to do YouTube videos. I know I'm gonna have to do this forever, basically. Uh, as <laughs> it's true. Like, I mean, it's like uh, until we we stop. Uh, doing that, like I know I'm gonna have to do that, and uh, kind of like gearing myself, preparing myself to to handle that. The other part that is quite imit intimidating with YouTube is it's uh, intimidating technically. Creating good quality videos requires handling a professional camera. Literally before this podcast, Mark could literally not start a recording on on the camera. I was Sony's uh, fault, not mine, but yeah. But they're all shit, you know. They're yeah. they're pretty difficult to use, to be honest. Um, and it's like, after that, you have done that, you actually need to edit the files and editing is definitely, it's not that difficult to learn. Like I think you can, if you just spend a week doing this and just do nothing else, you'll be a decent editor and you can put YouTube videos together. It's basically record yourself in a role and then just put some bureau on top, like some, uh, some footage to overlap. It works for every niche, um, but you still need to learn that. And while there are like, you know, baby editors, I call it, like even Canva is letting you do videos, etc. No way you're gonna do YouTube properly with this kind of stuff. You need to learn Premiere, Final Cut Pro, or Resolve, pretty much. It's one of these three that you need to pick. Resolve is free, so if you, it's not really a money thing, um, but you need to learn a professional video editing uh, tool, which uh, can take a little bit of time. And the final thing is it's extremely time consuming. It takes forever to script, shoot, edit, refine, etc. It needs to be good because it's based on retention. You can't just half ass your work, you immediately get slain. And you, can, you can't edit it after it's been uploaded as well, which is a big difference yeah, yeah. with, you know, written content. So. so it takes a long time. It can take dozens of hours for a single video. Uh, if you do all the work yourself, we get some help. It's not as bad. We also use AI for editing now. So we use a tool called Glink that actually auto cuts all the missed takes, etc. Uh, like, for example, a 10 minute video we released, probably there's like 30, 35 minutes of footage with all the, all the, the messed uh, takes that we have. And it's like this tool actually cuts 95% of them, maybe. So like no human has to do this anymore, but still it takes time to uh, transition and add the effects and add the uh, B-roll and all of that. It takes time. But uh, the, the reward is also is equally great to the, um, to the pain that it brings. And so that's pretty much YouTube. Now, who can do YouTube, who shouldn't do? I think review sites can definitely do YouTube. Um, people have a pretty decent click through rate on affiliate links on YouTube. And it's something that like now you can put the cards, like you know, I mentioned the card for the podcast. Uh, let's pop an affiliate link now if someone's uh, watching in our team <laughs> so people can see. Um, and then you can put it in your description. You can pin the first comment as well and put affiliate links there as well. So you have lots of places where you can, you can get people to click and people like watching product reviews. Like it is, a good format, unboxing, product reviews, etc. Like Unbox Therapy is massive, NKVG is massive, like all the tech YouTubers are massive, but even non-tech YouTubers can do really, really, really well, provided you get hands-on with the product. Um, the one thing as well is because YouTube gets a deeper connection, like when you talk to people, it's just deeper than reading a piece of content and you develop like signals of trust, right? People decide to trust you or not uh, based on how well shaven you are or something like this, you know? Uh, and uh, and, it, and that that, that's really important, you know? though, I, I would say, because it's quite often when we're at a conference, someone will come up to us and be like, oh, I've, I've watched every episode of your podcast, like all 300 and I didn't and read something. a single blog post. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that as well. But, you know, if someone's watching you for whatever, 300 odd hours or something, they're really going to get to know you and importantly, trust, trust you. you and, yeah. you know, they're much more likely to kind of buy from you and be engaged in that side of business as well. Yeah, so it's like, it's definitely like, you, you know, per person, you'll get a higher conversion rate just because of the trust factor, basically. So yeah, the, you can drive decent traffic, enough traffic to make good money from affiliate. Like it's not uh, tons and tons of traffic, but enough to convert people. You can reach lots of new people quite easily with the recommendation engine, which is, it's all arguably easier to reach people earlier than with Google where it takes time, takes a long time, for example. You can add affiliate links to the uh, community tab as well. So if there's a promo or something, you can do that. And you can transform your best affiliate offers into sponsors of your channel for extra revenue. Um, so that's actually a, a bonus. For ad sites, I would say, no, don't do it. Uh, unless you really want to make money from AdSense, but like you make so much more money from 
um, the ads on your site, that I would say it's just much more scalable. I would not bother with YouTube. To, I would just embed other people's videos on uh, from YouTube if I did that. Oh, one thing I forgot for the review sites is you can embed your videos on your post and increase time on page and engagement. Uh, and you can take one more spot on Google as well. So it's really quite good. Uh, and for product sites, yes, you should absolutely do it. I think uh, it's an easy way to grow your uh, audience. And instead of having a sponsored segment, just show your product basically. Uh, Lightning Tech Tips does that a lot as well. Like they have these, um, these uh, they have this, they sell, you know, clothing and merch. Screwdrivers and as well. Yeah, exactly. And it just like, they just put so much sponsors in their videos. I mean, Mr. Beast now as well, like you watch any video, there's like, I don't know how many chocolate ads and burger ads, etc. you can have in a, in a video, but they do quite a few, you know? Uh, so it's really a way to, to grow engagement, reach a lot of people. And a lot of people tend to buy your stuff just because they like you, like, uh, even if they don't really need a screwdriver or uh, a chocolate. That, that works better in like B2C niches where, you know, they sell a lot of products like a, you know, mm. a cardless wa or a wallet that fits your cards. It's I very disagree. Spicy. I These think if we sold, uh, I think if we sold fun t-shirts related to SEO, people would buy them, for example. Yeah, but um, you, you kind of need that critical mass of audience. You know, if you have a million yeah, it subscribers wouldn't be it for, the rich we have. for a small channel like ours. Uh, no, it's not worth it. It's not worth the effort. Yeah. But people would buy them. The people who follow would buy. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much uh, that's pretty much YouTube for me. The one thing is like, how do you do this? Step one, forget forget SEO keywords. Focus on engagement. Uh, create stuff that people talk about. So go on like for example the subreddits of your niche. Check what people talk about on Twitter. Check what kind of posts people react to on Facebook, etc. Create content around that. Or if there any news around this, uh, do something like this so that you can get. Like the recommendation engine is much more important than the keywords. The only time where you want to create kind of like keyword focused content is when you have a page with lots of organic traffic and you want to put that video on that page. Like then it may be worth doing this. Um, but then that's the second step. Embed your content on your high traffic pages on SEO. So people who watch the video from your site will actually start seeing your videos recommended to them on YouTube if they're logged in. So it's like it's a way to uh, leverage your SEO traffic and improve your SEO traffic by increasing engagement on page. So you kind of get a nice relationship there. That's what Kevin did when he started, actually, Kevin is pure too. And then uh, we really like using the email list to boost the views early when we post a video. So like when this podcast is going to be posted within an hour, you'll receive an email that where we tell you, hey, we have a new podcast, go check it out. And we'll link you directly to YouTube. Uh, the goal is to boost the initial views and engagement so that YouTube gets the, these metrics and decides how much they want to promote it to people who don't uh, subscribe to us. And you, you basically leverage the, the referral engine with your email list. And in a lot, on a lot of social sites like that, you can use your email list to and your SEO traffic to basically get an unfair advantage. And you, you will get a massive advantage compared to someone starting without an audience. So if you have a site already, it's much faster to grow your YouTube channel than if you don't. So that's pretty much it. You can jump on the next one if you want. Okay, the next one is Facebook, one of the older, certainly in this list, uh, social networks. It has, I just looked this up, around 3 billion active daily users, which is a pretty significant percentage of the people on this planet. Um, now, being one of the older platforms, it's tried to kind of do a lot of things to stay relevant. So it's copied a lot of features that Snapchat and TikTok and all these other tools have. So when I was preparing this, it's less, with YouTube, it's okay, you make videos, you post them, great. On Facebook, there's quite a lot of different things you can do and different angles you can take with this. So for example, you have your Facebook page where you supposedly post updates about what you and your business have been doing and then you get lots of people to, to view them. Although maybe not so much anymore because they seem to be uh, somewhat killing. No, 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 don't say that. Don't say that, it's not true anymore, it's changed. It's changed recently and that's why all the niche site owners are investing into it. So the recommendation engine on Facebook now is pushing a lot of like random posts. Go and scroll your feed on mobile and you will see how much sh stuff that you don't like is being pushed in your face. So they're trying to kind of like TikTok the feed, you know, and uh, AI recommend stuff. And that's one of the reasons why uh, a lot of like niche site owners, so like Fatstack, um, Anmos, etc. They recommend people. I mean, they don't recommend. They run an experiment to basically grow your Facebook page by buying likes uh, through ads, so that they can grow their site. But that's why I disagree with them because actually, what's happening is good. Facebook is like TikToking itself and it's showing a lot of links. Actually, it can drive quite a lot of traffic recently uh, when you share your links. 
but it's based on the recommendation engine, not really on your on your followers anymore. It's like it's kind of like most platforms. Do you have your followers? But your followers are just merely an indication that you're somewhat interested in seeing the content from that page. But they still will apply a lot of filters. So sometimes you follow someone, you won't see that post. But quite often now on most social platforms, you will see posts of like stuff you don't follow as well uh, because they just decided that it's relevant to you. And so Facebook's pushing that pretty hard on Facebook pages now. It's like if you have a good post, you can drive lots of traffic. And some people are getting tens of thousands of clicks from a link shared on Facebook. But like it's kind of a hit or miss thing, right? It's like you're going to share, you're going to get 10 clicks or you can get 10,000 clicks, uh, depending on whether the algorithm likes your piece of content. And usually the threshold it is, the better it works. Um, so it's like, uh, it's it's very different content than your SEO content. Your SEO content is never gonna work. Um, like for example, if you have a skincare site, you could say, you know, 10 skincare recipes for summer, that wouldn't work. But if you say, here's the exact skincare routine that Rihanna uses during her pregnancy, then you're probably gonna get lots of clicks, for example, and that's probably gonna work really well. Yeah, and it's one of these things that is so dependent on the the industry. I feel it works a lot better for for sort of you know celebrities, cooking, weight loss, beauty, you know, this this types of, of, uh, of people stuff. People are getting, no, I disagree again. <laughs> I disagree again. It depends on what your profile is. Like I get business stuff. Yeah, because Facebook has a list of your interests. You can actually go consult the list of interests they associate your profile with if you go in your privacy settings. Uh, and based on that, they will show you stuff. They will basically apply the same matching as they do with Facebook ads, but for organic content on Facebook pages. For some reason, they, I, I think they realize that people of a certain age like to click on links to read content, so they actually push them more so that people come back more on Facebook. Um, that is, that so, is one thing with, with Facebook, though. It, it's the demographic. It's much more, I don't want to say older, because there's like people our age and stuff as well, but you ask any 21-year-old yeah, these days, and they're not on Facebook. They don't even have an account. Yeah, it's, they don't like it. But like, yeah, it's like, so you can drive traffic from Facebook, but you need to create content made for Facebook. You know, it's Facebook changes their mind, right? It's like there are periods, like you were mentioning, oh, Facebook pages don't drive any traffic because for a long time, Facebook has literally killed pages reach and nobody would see these pages anymore. And now, for some reason, they've decided that like trashy links and, and shitty memes should get some reach <laughs> from pages and therefore uh, they're doing this. But that's my problem with building this, Two is twofold. First, people who build this with ads, uh, you need to think about the Facebook uh, ad inventory, right? It's like people, most people buy Facebook ads, they focus on conversions, right? It's like sales, like e-com, et cetera, et cetera. So everyone's competing for the impressions to people who are likely to buy. When you buy like ads, you're basically buying ads to everyone else. So people who are less likely to buy stuff, people who have no money to spend, et cetera, because the rest of the inventory Facebook has and they shift it and it's the lowest quality inventory, that's why they're cheap. So you're building an audience that's not taking action. Um, the second thing is that Facebook can change this overnight and so you might spend lots of time building your, I, I could say that for any platform, but Facebook has a history of doing this, like a much bigger history of doing this than YouTube has, for example. YouTube changes, but it's not as big and heavy on creators as, as this could be because we've literally seen pages do really well, then be killed to obliv oblivion and now come back kind of like midway, etc. So it's like, I've, I, I, Facebook's okay. And if you have an older audience, I think it can be good, especially if you run Facebook ads and you have a product site because you grow your likes through that, through your, through your ads. So, you, you know, we have quite a few likes uh, Instagram followers through ads. Uh, and it's like, yeah, we can, if I share something, we, we get a few hundred clicks. But uh, it's like investing heavily as a content site, I think it can be dangerous actually. There's uh, there's another side to Facebook as well that we haven't talked about, which is the the kind of groups community um, side of things as well. And there's there's I, I would split that into two categories. There's for your existing customers audience, like your in Authority Hacker, we have the the Authority Site System Mastermind Group and the Authority Hacker Pro community in there for our customers. And when we're posting, you know, this podcast, we post it on there and some of those people will, will click through and, and watch it. Um, the, the fact that so many people have a Facebook account and use it daily or, or a lot of the time means that you don't have to build another platform and get people on there. They're just, they're already there. So it's it's a place to, that you, that you wanna be with, your, with that type of content. The other side though of it, which we don't do at the moment, we did used to do this a, a while ago and there are some uh, communities in, in our industry doing it, but is the, uh, like free community for people who just follow you or like you, so not your paid customers. 
and you have an opportunity to interact with people here in a more kind of so it's, it's one to many, but there can be one on one interactions within the public group uh, and kind of build trust, build engagement that way as well. Do, do you remember why we gave it up? Was there a reason at the time? Because it was, it was quite a long time ago now. Uh, because it takes a lot of uh, moderation, free groups. People try to sell their shit all the time and we didn't want to bother with that. There, uh, there are better <laughs> tools like for like moderation and approving people and things like that now than there, there used to be for, for sure. Um, but you know, looking at some of the bigger groups out there, uh, ClickFunnels has like three hundred thousand people in their group, and they use it, you know, obviously to heavily promote ClickFunnels and what you can do. And there's some interaction and stuff there as well. Um, there are non-brand, like more interest-based communities. So one of the bigger ones out there is this Cooking Made Easy group, uh, and the focus of the business here seems to be more on just promoting the the group. Actually, in in my city in Edinburgh in the UK, there's a, it's called Edinburgh Gossip Girls. My wife's part of it. Uh, it's, <laughs> it's, it's a women community for women in, in Edinburgh. And like the the owner of it has, you know, the, that Facebook group is the business. Uh, there's ads uh, and like sponsored stuff she sells on there as well. Um, and, and, and really, they, they, don't, they haven't branched out anywhere beyond that just because of people people are interested in it and people that age are interested in and in using it a lot. So, you know, it can be the entire, an entire business, a, a group, but you can yeah. build an email list as well. Like a lot of people, when you join the group, you know, you can ask questions and a lot of people like ask the email and they just put you in like a MailChimp or something like this and yeah, then you just send promo emails. ClickFunnels does that when, when you apply yeah. to, to join their group. And, you know, they, the Facebook, to be fair, have, have added more features to help creators like do things like that directly or indirectly. Um, so it's it's gone a little bit better. There's also, I mean, it's probably not that great for it, but like, so if you're doing any any kind of uh, meetup or conference or in-person event, then you can you can have a Facebook event, and everyone who's going will click and like it, and they can interact with each other. You can then not only hype it up to sell tickets, but you can promote the other things that your company does. Uh, and I've seen this done quite effectively for during the pandemic a lot when people couldn't do in-person events. So we're doing kind of global online events, essentially webinars, uh, and kind of promoting things that way as well. And it, you know, did all right through through Facebook. I think you use Facebook to grow community, like you use the search engine, people discover you and then you just capture people. And yeah, the, the webinars are strong for converting, plus capturing the emails, etc. Yeah, it's, it's a great list builder. And um, I think the idea of creating a generic community around your niche can be a, a strong way to start kind of like building some a real audience, not just people who pass by your site as well, which um, and overall, it's also a trading uh, trading tool, right? It's like you could be tr you could be doing your outreach link building and be like, hey, I'll promote your stuff on my group with uh, 50,000 people or something. And that's something that people will trade for. And uh, so it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an asset that can be quite easy. The only problem is, yeah, it still takes some moderation and some work to maintain a community and you might need to kind of like contribute more when you start it. Yeah, definitely. And one of the, I guess, challenges with Facebook especially, but all, all these platforms to an extent is when you try to take people off platform, there's often, not always, but often uh, a bit of a hit to the reach you get. So if you, let's say uh, this podcast, so on YouTube, if we post, just go post that YouTube video on our Facebook page. Oh, it doesn't it just yeah. doesn't want to show it to people because it's like, oh, well, you're just going to take people to YouTube away from Facebook. But if we post like something specific about it on Facebook, it will get more more reach. So you have to be a little bit careful um, with with sort of playing playing with that side of things as well. Um, yeah, we do reels like native content on all platforms does way, 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 way better than linking somewhere else. Like in general, platforms don't like you, don't like yeah. people leaving. Pin uh, Pinterest so like, is maybe like, we'll get to that in a, a little bit later. It's that's maybe the an example one, of yeah. one that's like, is a bit more open to that and that's what's unique about it. But they um, did like Facebook, you know, they did a lot of traffic, then they kind of killed it, then now they bring it back. It's like, it's it's a little like Facebook. Uh, and this, yeah. th this, this kind of changing of um, what works and what you can do and what you can get out of it it's a real problem for everything. You think we have it bad in SEO with all these Google updates and things like that. You know, they they, they change they move the goalposts on all these other platforms far more often um, and far more significantly. I would more say more drastically. Um, like look at the reels and short videos, like taking so much space. Yeah. And it's like lots of people were not creating videos and they had to 
learn a new content form if they yeah. wanted to to maintain their reach. It's a lot of work, yeah. Uh, and I think it's their role. Like SEOs don't realize because they're kind of living in the, in their little world, but like it's changing every, everywhere. Like FBA sellers, it changes all the time, uh, and all these platforms is the same, yeah. yeah. So overall, who should use Facebook? I think. I feel it's nice. I would not, you know, for that intent thing that I mentioned. There's, there's, um, a, there's a really good example of this as well. So, I mean, you used about, talked about security.org. So VPN mentor, 1.5 million traffic, according to Ahrefs. I think they sold a, a while back um, for mm -hmm. 150 million or something. Massive, massive. As part of a package. Not affiliate, site. affiliate site. Uh, one of the biggest affiliate sites out, out there, certainly. Um, it has, they have 11,000 likes on Facebook, which I think is less than us. They ha their posts get one or two likes each. Now, okay, maybe there's an argument to say Facebook tracks everything. Uh, this VPNs are about not tracking, and you know the, there's maybe a dynamic there at play. Yeah. But in general, if you're if you're running the site that's like you, you get people who are interested at that moment in the thing, you recommend them something, yeah. you make your commission, and then you're probably never going to see them again. Then building a community and building regular engagement through any of these platforms, Facebook especially, is probably not going to work, I would say. For, um, for ads, no. Not for, rev for affiliates, no. But for ads, I think there's a play to be made, actually. Uh, I think with AI, like there's a really big opportunity to just respin random news about people or giving, giving a certain angle, posting on your Facebook page quite quickly. Like We're talking like an hour you can spin a post quickly, resharing a news of like, you know, Rihanna, as I said, Rihanna shared her skincare routine on Instagram. Or if something. it's and if it's something that, that if it's something that everyone might be interested in, because that, that like if you break down the Rihanna, not thing, everyone, but a large, a large, yeah, a large it's audience. it's skincare, it's celebrity, it's Rihanna. Like the people who yeah. are interested in one of those three things are massive. There's a, like, a significant percentage of people, but people who want to buy a VPN at that time, like yeah, yeah, that doesn't. You know, I, I feel like, it says forget it, don't do this. Yeah. Um, but ad sites, there is a play to be made, uh, arguably, where you could create, craft these posts based on social media. To be honest, I would just follow whoever is relevant on social media, plus check Google News, have some Google alerts around some keywords, etc. Have some kind of system that all the information gets into Notion or something, and then just spin that off into quick articles that are timely shared on a page. And I think... Um, in the early days of an ad site, you potentially can drive more traffic that way than from Google. In the early days, uh, it doesn't scale like might not scale as much, but you get these huge traffic spikes when one takes off. And I think that can work. It's like it's definitely that's an experiment that would be fun to run. Actually, um, starting like that, but still still mixing that with SEO, uh, especially like earning links from that. Um, but a lot a lot of what you see on Facebook is like uh, writes up on social media posts of. Uh, you know, people that are influent, basically. <laughs> and um, and I think that's, there's a play here, and, and you can do that. For product sites, the difference is like, you should be running ads, so you will grow an audience. And if you're running ads, then um, like you can at least use Facebook to like share news about your company, updates, sales, da, 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 et cetera, uh, more than like making it a pure traffic play, rather just like be in people's feeds that engage on Facebook. And I think that's how I would handle Facebook. In terms of uh, actually um, doing it, I would say that you really have to, by the time this goes out or you watch this, if you're watching this in the future, they'll probably have introduced new content formats copied from the latest social network that's, that's doing really well. At the moment, reels, shorts, stories, these kinds of things, these kind of short form, you know, uh, horizontal, vertical video um, is is doing really well. Um, and that, that tends to, to work, whether you're engaging with uh, your existing audience uh, who already follow you or like reels, you know, showing up in the recommendation engine for, for doom scrollers um, can can be an option as well. Um, you really you want to maybe think about bringing people onto the platform who what, who consume your content on your site, who follow you on other platforms, who are on your, your email list as well. So you being there and you, there being a place for them to interact with you, one-on-one, uh, -on one-to-many -one um, is, is, is an interesting option to think about as well if you're creating a community or, or, or a group. Um, doing events there, Facebook even has like a, li a live video kind of webinar type yeah, thing can. built into it now as well. Nobody which is, does it, but yeah. It's not, it's not as good <laughs> as any of the webinar software, but hey, it works and it's free and like you, you can do it. And if you do it- It's not a webinar, it's just live, but like, you know, it's like if you want to go live, you can go live on Twitter, you can go live on, on Facebook, on YouTube, you can go live everywhere. Most people just go live on YouTube at this point, like very few people 
uh, that want to sell something would do this on Facebook. You can post your videos on Facebook, right? You, there's a YouTube competitor, etc. Yeah. Um, but still, like the format on YouTube on Facebook now is like the best formats are links and images. I would say reels don't do that well. Um, they do worse than on Instagram, for example. It's the, it's kind of like a separate part of the network, so I wouldn't do that. But talking about short form video. Let's jump on to the next one, and that's going to be one that is dominated by them, and that's TikTok. Uh, so that is the doom scrolling that I had to do for this episode, so uh, rip my, my schedule. Um, but uh, the, TikTok is an interesting one, right? It's a, it's a really big network. There's a billion people using it already, like a third of Facebook that had more than a decade to grow it. So it's doing really well. And if you have a video that does well, you will reach lots of people. There's actually not as many creators on TikTok than there are on YouTube, for example, or than there are even on Instagram, etc. So you have a large audience on one side and you have fewer creators on the other. The problem is the audience. The audience is mostly young people. Most people above 35 are tend to not use TikTok very actively. Most people, I'm not saying if you're using My, my wife's TikTok. grandmother uses it. So, mm -hmm. you know, that just okay. not everyone. Uh, but like, it's it's definitely a younger audience. It's also an audience with less money because they're younger. Mm, therefore, they're harder to monetize. And there's no links in TikTok except in the bio. Um, they're, 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 you cannot link almost anywhere. I think you might be able to link in the comments or something, uh, but that's it. And on top of that, it's as tedious as YouTube ish like the, the video the production quality per video is lower much lower but the volume of videos expected is much higher and so when you add up these two things together with very hungry people on the platform that want to grow fast and and put lots of efforts into it it can be quite challenging uh to grow there um so that's pretty much the downsides for it um now who should use this i think affiliate sites don't don't bother Although I have an example of an affiliate site I'm going to share a little bit later. Um, the only case I would do this as an affiliate personally would be if I'm building an email list. And then I would put my squeeze page link in the bio. And I would just at the end of my uh, videos, I'd be like, hey, uh, check bio link for more. Just that, right? And it's like people would just uh, go and click on that link and land on the squeeze page and then give me their email, and then I monetize them via email. That makes sense because you can only drive so much traffic on this platform. For ad sites, don't even bother. There's no traffic, there's no money as well. Uh, they don't pay people as much as on YouTube. Uh, so don't bother, uh, don't, yeah, don't. And if you have a product site, well, if you are in these kind of like very visual niches, uh, or if you're in um, kind of like uh, information niches, that works really well. Uh, you can actually reach lots of people, get lots of engagement and do quite well. Um, uh, it's it's funny, it's like, we actually got affected by a TikTok campaign on Atari Hacker recently. Uh, you don't know that, Mark. But uh, Louis Vuitton actually ran a TikTok campaign to promote their affiliate program. And uh, what happened is there has been a massive surge of searches for the keyword Louis Vuitton affiliate program. You won't see it in any keyword tool. You won't see it. It's going to be dying off by the time we use this podcast anyway. Uh, so it's, like, it's fine. But like, it's just for the story. We, we have a page that uh, does not target this keyword, but targets uh, luxury affiliate programs that ranks decently for it. And we got something like five or six X the traffic to that page in the past few weeks um, just because of that TikTok campaign. So I, I just wanted to say that to show how if you're a product owner, you uh, search traffic can be affected and branded search traffic. And talking about that, that's where we jump into my example, where I found an affiliate site called Mattress Nerd that did a video on the best pillow for side sleepers. Uh, and you know, to basically just, and it got 115,000 views on TikTok. It gives you an idea of like how much views you can get if you're doing well on TikTok. And, and I was interested in like, how do they monetize that, right? And the way they monetize that is by manipulating search traffic as well. Their end call to action says, Google best pillows for site sleepers, mattress nerds. You know, they put that brand in there and click on the first result to go read our full report. That's basically the call to action. And what they're trying to do is they're trying to manipulate search with the, their target keyword in there and show Google their page is relevant through driving organic traffic. Now, I want to see how they rank for uh, best pillow for side sleepers. And it's a very difficult keyword. And they're not that big of a site. I think they're DR60 or something. Like, they're not that big. They're, they're a good site, but they're not that big. And they rank number 21, which is, you'd be like, oh, that's not so great. But they rank above, like, Telegraph and some good housekeeper sites, etc. Like, they rank above some, some big sites that are also competing for that keyword. So 
I would say it probably worked to an extent, but it's not enough to take them to page one. Uh, but it was still interesting to see like how does an affiliate site that does okay on TikTok uh, uses that as their call to action, basically. If you want to get started on TikTok, how do you do this? Um, the way I would do this is, again, use your existing audience as an unfair advantage to grow. And the way you do that is launch three to five videos on your profile, uh, and then after that, promote to your other channels, mostly email lists, but like, let's say you have a YouTube channel, you can put that in your promotion tab. If you have a Facebook page with lots of people because you do ads, you can uh, promote that there, et cetera. You will not get that many clicks on, on social because people hate like these networks hate when you promote another network. Um, but on your email list, you can get lots of clicks. Also, add the links to your footer, add the links to the footer of your emails, add the links to like kind of like all your communication, like uh, your email signatures, et cetera. And over time, you're gonna grow followers that will engage with your content. As people engage with your content, the recommendation engines go to this job, find more people like them, and recommend your content to them until it finds your audience. But what you really want at the beginning is this first, you know, 200 views on a video, and then that, that will take the video further. If you can't get there, you will get no distribution. If you can get these first few views, then the network will take care of the rest and find an audience for you. Um, so that's pretty much how you do this. But TikTok is really for building an email list, I would say, like I, I, or, or brand awareness. I would not bother with it. So it's not my favorite network, to be honest. Yeah, I've seen a lot of people who have like uh, health type products or beauty type products do really well yeah, that but, works. Um, on there. There's, there's something about the way videos are created that it feels more impartial when you're talking about your own product because often you're using, you know, like this third party, um, you won't believe what happens when da 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 da, and it's like someone else's voice just saying you. it. So yeah, these 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 types of, um, con and also the content formats, because the way it kind of repeats itself, I know other platforms are, are doing the same now, um, but they, they kind of, it, there's a lot of creative uses of, of that as like the video, the, the end of the video feeds in the start of it. and creates this kind of uh, um, engagement, like people keep watching the video again, or, you know, you, you've probably seen these ones, you have to like pause the video at a certain point to see something, you know. Yeah, they do it on purpose so that if you watch the video multiple times, it, it sends a signal, yeah, yeah. Exactly, also they make it loop, right? So at the end of the video, is the is, it loops with the beginning of the video, so you don't realize it's looping. So you're watching one and a half times the video or something, by the time you realize it's the same thing. And uh, that also gets more distribution. So lots of tricks to do on TikTok. Um, but really, it's a platform that's quite self-contained. Like, it drives very little traffic. They actually have something called TikTok Shopping that they're releasing that will have pretty much a built-in affiliate program. They're kind of like going after e-com. And they will, it will have a built-in affiliate program for creators, et cetera. Let's see how it goes. Uh, it seems to, like, it's invite only, et cetera. You can apply, but it's not so easy now. I don't think a lot of people buy from TikTok yet. Um, but it's going to be interesting to observe how it goes because a lot of people, for example, like this Amazon influencer program, which allows you to do the same thing. So uh, it's it's there's definitely a, something happening in this area of like video creation for products, and TikTok is going to be part of it. Uh, let's talk about something a bit more serious, which is LinkedIn. Um, this is, I think, good because it's very business friendly, not just creator friendly. Uh, so, you know, and it's also one of these ones where most businesses, most companies are not banning employees from w uh, going on LinkedIn at work, though they are, uh, you know, they'll block TikTok on their, I mean, everyone has a phone these days for it, but like, you know, it's, it, it, it's more open, let's say, um, at, a, at a corporate level. Um, also, I find that organic reach isn't as stingy as it Pretty is good, on yeah. some other platforms. I think part of that is because there's a lot of kind of B2B content on there. So the audience is just naturally smaller. So, you know, you, you know, know why? Because Microsoft owns it and therefore they're not, they don't care that much. It's like Microsoft doesn't really on LinkedIn to well, make money. The, the, the thing I, uh, the thing I think driving this is the business model of LinkedIn is not so much them selling ads, though they do sell ads. Uh, it's, it's not, it's the only model on Facebook because it's B2B they make a lot of money by selling LinkedIn premium subscriptions. It's where you yeah. can you know, see who viewed you and send more messages to people and all that, so that sort of stuff. Um, so as long as they're driving people, as long as they're driving subscribers like that, then they're happier to have, you know, a more, drive more engagement to the, the, the people using it so they get more users on there. So, the, so those premium subscribers go there so they can advertise or get in touch with those those users. So it kind of it drives it that way, which is a little bit different to to all the other ones. 
Um, in terms of like who uses it and who can use it, I think anyone in the, the B2B space, B2C stuff as well works, but it tends to be kind of bigger publication, you know, the economist or a newspaper might, might be on there. Um, in terms of practical uses though of, of LinkedIn, there's a, a good example by uh, an Authority Hacker Pro member, uh, Doug Haynes actually. Uh, so he has, I mean, he has a, an agency, digital agency in the UK and um, there's this like carousel format that works really well on, on LinkedIn at the moment. So think of it as like a, a, a PowerPoint point presentation, but like, you know, small and there's just like one point per page. It's a little bit vi visual. Um, they, they do this with ads as well, but it, it works well um, on just organic content. You have a 25 slide carousel on the opportunity for digital marketing it, with pets or something like that. Uh, and put that out there. And, you know, with a couple thousand subscribers, you might get, you know, a few dozen uh, people liking it. You might get a hundred or so people uh, watching it. But if your product is, if you're, the value of a customer is tens of thousands of dollars, as it is with, with many agencies, you only need one or two people here, one or two leads from, from these to, to suddenly for it to be worthwhile. Um, and that's that's what's happened um, uh, in in this case with with Doug's LinkedIn, uh, and it's, uh, it's it's driving you know valuable leads leads to him that way. So um, that's kind of the way to to do it on LinkedIn at the moment. I mean, obviously, if you're a big content site, you can just post your content, you'll get some clicks to it. But the size of LinkedIn is much smaller than Facebook and Instagram and Twitter and all these these places. Um, so you there's know, another hack the on numbers. LinkedIn. Uh, so you can actually write full blog posts on LinkedIn. You know that, right? There's like, if you're a creator, you have this option to write full blog posts. These full blog posts uh, can be indexed in Google. <laughs> you know what that means? It means you, you, you get to post on a DR 90 something site if you want. And, and uh, it happened a few times. It's like they, sometimes they rank well. It's not as strong as you would imagine, but it, it, you can rank well for some stuff. And I've seen several people kind of like Parasite SEO on LinkedIn. I don't know if they've changed it because I haven't seen as many recently. But I've definitely for a while seen uh, blog posts on LinkedIn sometimes compete with us, etc. And it was a, a bit of a pain in the ass. Uh, but there is an option to post these things. Otherwise, like you get to use it a bit like Medium. So you make kind of like a shorter version of your article. Very easy to do with AI. Uh, and you can put a call to action to the main, uh, to the main article, for example. So it's, you post natively, therefore you get distribution. And then you just like do referral traffic at the end or even at the beginning if you want. Uh, and again, yeah, AI can do these things very, very quickly. And I would recommend everyone who has a niche that applies to LinkedIn to look at this. And even a niche like VPN, et cetera, you can definitely spin it for LinkedIn. Um, so it's like you can go a little bit wider than just like pure business stuff. Let's talk about the next one and let's talk about Instagram. Probably should have done it with Facebook because there's definitely, when you're a company, you can cross post between uh, Instagram and uh, Facebook. So when you post a photo on Instagram, you get to post it on your Facebook page. And quite often that's what we do when we post social updates. Instagram, 500 million people every day, quite a few people. Um, there's only two places where you can put your links though. That's in stories. And that can drive pretty good traffic if you have a good engagement with them. And in your bio link, that's pretty much it. Uh, it's also a platform that a lot of journalists use. So EAT is quite important if you want to be seen there, et cetera. You can make content and actually get uh, links to your Instagram, but mostly uh, mentions, brand mentions. Now, in terms of the, the types of sites that I would use it for, affiliate sites, mm, I don't like it so much. Doom scrolling, mostly people that are not looking to buy, uh, I would not bother. Ad sites is also something I would ignore. Too little traffic. Uh, you need to get, like, unless you're really good at stories, but honestly, that's going to be 0.001% of people who listen to this podcast. The only actually uh, type of business that would use this for is actually product sites. I would um, like show your product or um, make reels. So for example, a lot of people, uh, I have inf iPhone photography school, for example, right? They do reels that do tutorials on how to use your iPhone and they do uh, very cool looking photos that get high engagement. And then if you engage with one of these, then their ads take over and retarget you and sell you their courses. And that's how they monetize their Instagram. Like there's a direct path to money, right? There's no direct path to money for affiliate sites, there's no direct pass to money to ad sites or very little because very few uh, visitors. But here, because they pay for ads behind, like they use their organic reach to profile the right kind of people. And then after that, have targeted ads show to them. 
And it's very difficult to lose money on retargeting with this kind of strategy. Like this is definitely uh, quite profitable. So Instagram, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on it. It's not my favorite platform for site owners, uh, unless you really want to build your personal brand or something like this. Uh, let's talk about the next one then, which is going to be Pinterest. Now, uh, it's another one that has changed somewhat over the years, but uh, one of the main things which we talked about earlier, about Pinterest being so good, is that it's friendlier than many other platforms to taking your traffic or to taking traffic off site. Um, every pin that you have can have uh, links to, to your site or to the uh, blog post that it came from. Um, and it doesn't seem to too negatively uh, affect um, in engagement and how that gets gets distributed. One of the other things that's really interesting about Pinterest is that around 75% of the audience is female. So if your niche uh, targets women more than men, then you know it's, it's certainly a place that you, you might wanna consider um, looking at to, to, to generate extra, extra traffic. It's very sort of B2C. Um, you know, consumer niches work very well in here. Li anything to do with sort of lifestyle, um, interior design. Like I, I use Pinterest a lot. If you know, want to do up the bathroom, you go there to get ideas and and kind of um, get inspiration for things. So it's very much like a. Uh, it can be very much like a discovery platform for like what are the options for things I can do here. So you may be a little bit earlier in the buying journey for for what whatever it is, rather than you know looking for a review of X Y Z, you know bathroom fixture or whatever it might be. Um, so things like fashion, cooking, apparel um, also work work really well. It's just having a look through some of the the larger. Um, Pinterest celebrities, um, or the Pinterest rich list, I think as the, the blog post described it as. And there's this woman, Oh Joy, who has about 15 million followers on, on there. But interestingly, um, only gets about 4.1 million views per month off of that. Now, I, I found that fascinating because she has amazing, like many boards, you know, she works with Target and has like her own line of, of uh, products in there and stuff as well. And all of her photos look amazing. It, it's great. now. I then compared that to Kevin from Epic Gardening, and he uses Pinterest mostly to post video content. And he only has 82,000 followers. So 15 million, 82,000. But he gets 5 million monthly views according to, to Pinterest versus 4.1 million views for Oh Joyce, seemingly one of the biggest uh, people on, on Pinterest. So. You know, there's there's obviously something in there about posting video content versus image content. I don't know whether that's a Pinterest specific thing or just in 2023 and beyond, people, you know, with smartphones and uh, data. Are, Pinterest are, got a page of the book from TikTok as well. I think they they also pushed it hard when TikTok got big. Um, but I think they're scaling that back a little bit. Like people, well, I've seen the chat online is like people scale that back a little bit and they start to get more traffic again to their site because obviously videos don't drive as much traffic. Yeah. So pe a lot of people dropped Pinterest as a traffic source because it wasn't w uh, nearly as much traffic as it was initially. And now it seems to be coming back. So it's like, yeah, the, all the rage now is like Facebook pages and um, and Pinterest as uh, as the best alternative sources for site owners. Uh, and uh, and you can still create like classic pins, etc. And they, they do a bit better now, but still video is part of Pinterest now. And also shopping, like there's a lot of like these shopping buttons that uh, site owners can put in there, etc. So it's almost better when you own an e-com than uh, if you're an affiliate. And I think that's something to say as well. It's like as an affiliate, again, you're part of doom scrolling. Uh, intent is not super high. It's a bit higher than it would be on other platforms. Like people tend to go to Pinterest to shop and they know that there are shopping options and they're used to that. So it's like, it's probably like better. And if you are selling like furniture or something like this, maybe I think you could do okay uh, with the right photos. But um, ad sites can definitely drive lots of traffic if they have lots of images. Uh, a lot of people are, are definitely running Pinterest plus ads and doing quite well with Mediavan and AdThrive. And Pro, uh, people who have e-coms, they also do really quite well. Uh, the people who tend to not do well is kind of like uh, info niches. It's a bit harder to represent visually uh, for a lot of these things. I guess you could do infographics, etc. but I don't see these do as well as like beautiful photos on Pinterest. So I guess that's the one niche that I would probably avoid there. Uh, so let's talk about Twitter. So Twitter, I definitely have more first-hand experience uh, talking about this one. Uh, 
<laughs> so I'm reading my notes. Um, I'm reading the first drawback, and it says Elon Musk, you know. Uh, <laughs> it's like, um, I, I, on Twitter, whether you subscribe or not to Elon Musk, you see his tweets everywhere, basically. It's just like, now it's it's kind of ridiculous. Uh, it's basically the guy just bought, bought this as his personal platform to reach people. Uh, it's like Donald Trump is jealous, I think. But anyway, why is it good? Um, you can reach lots of people quickly. Um, again, has a really strong recommendation engine. You don't need follow account doesn't matter. I, and what, probably let's just open that up. Follow account doesn't matter on most of these platforms. Most of these platforms have strong recommendation engines, and and it's it's what drives the platform, not what pe like following is more of a legacy feature for most of these anymore. And rather an indication that you're interested in that person's content, but most of the time, if you really p push content on these platforms, your views or, or like people viewing your content will not be your followers. Um, and that's something that you shouldn't worry too much about it. And Twitter is definitely one of them, right? It's like when I do, like I've had tweets getting like hundreds of thousands of views with tens of thousands of subscribers, you know, because of the recommendation engine. So like if you build something that hits with people, like it works and you will get lots of reach and people will discover you. They, they, and it's really quite cool like people getting to know what you do provided you do something that adds value is not just a generic affiliate site um, it, it might be interesting and for me it opened up a lot of opportunities for like uh, networking with people business partnerships uh, things like that and it's like if you think past just getting your little click on your affiliate link it, it can be quite powerful and you can get uh, you know sponsors for example things like that works quite well what i love about twitter is it's slow effort content creation it's just text and images at best. I mean, you can do videos, but you don't have to, you know, it's like definitely. So it, I like to use it as a way to test engagement content ideas. So for example, we said YouTube videos are a lot of work, right? It's really difficult to create a YouTube video. It takes a long time, etc. But you could make a very, very basic version of something you're gonna share in your YouTube video in a Twitter thread. And that's going to take you 20 minutes, like a couple of screenshots or a couple of photos and uh, some text. And, and you can quickly see whether people engage with this or not. And that's tell, and you know, I like to use this as a way to test content ideas. Like I'll test like three, four, five ideas, see what engages best and make a video about that, for example. And that ensures a higher hit rate on your higher effort content creation. And I think that's, that for me, that's kind of the role of Twitter. It's just like throw shit at the wall and see what works because it's like, it's low effort, you know? Um, and one thing as well that's cool is like uh, good tweets can be recycled on other platforms. So if you check our Instagram account, I've put sometimes like screenshots of my tweet talk about being narcissistic, you know? Uh, and, um, and it tends to be our higher engagement posts actually. Like these work quite well. And you can post these screenshots on Facebook, on LinkedIn, et cetera. So there's a lot of recycling that, that can be uh, happening here. So it's like if you combine, even if your reach on Twitter is not the best, uh, if you combine that and take your higher engagement stuff and put it on the other platforms, like that's a, because it's low effort, it's a very, uh, very good uh, time spent per person reached. I would say that. The big downside of Twitter on top of Elon Musk is that uh, link sharing is heavily punished. So it's very hard to drive traffic uh, to anything on Twitter. Usually, if I share the podcast, for example, I'll put like the first tweet without a link. And my goal is to get that tweet to do well and put a second tweet under it with the link. And so like, because I know if I just put a link in the first tweet, there's no way anyone's going to see this. And I tend to get more clicks doing this mm -hmm. than actually sharing a link. Into it. That gives you an idea of like how heavily punished links are. Um, so it's very difficult. So it's good to test is good to and it's kind of like an open chat to people like a lot of brands use this as like a support channel for example like it's just uh, a way to interact with people but as a platform to drive traffic i think it's pretty terrible um so don't use it as a content as a content idea generator use it as a way to engage use it as a way to network uh in your dms etc do not use it to drive traffic so it's really for the people who care about their niche like people who are more than just trying to drive a bit of traffic and making quick conversions. People who want to establish themselves as someone, everyone important on Twitter. Um, even, <laughs> even though, even with the change of ownership, etc., everyone important is on Twitter, uh, and and it allows you to openly talk to anyone. That's the only platform that lets you do that. Like you don't have to follow each other to tweet at someone, for example. Uh, which the, like it, it, yeah, you can network. So if you want to go on Twitter, what do you do? Step one, 
engage with big accounts in your industry. Just drop useful comments, add value on top of what they're saying, something like this. Because uh, the comment section under a big tweet is what you're going to get more traffic than on your own profile when you get started. Um, so like that's where you want to exist. People, if you drop something smart or interesting, people will follow you from there, engage with your stuff, start seeing your stuff. That's pretty much step one. So like start stalking the big profile. And then the second thing is to produce two, only two to four high value tweets per week, but high value I'm talking, not just like uh, tweeting what you ate for lunch, you know? Um, four examples of, of high value tweets or Twitter thread. One is success story. So like, oh, I, I've done this and I've lost 10 kilos or uh, I've used ChatGPT for this and I managed to do that. And, or uh, I've uh, changed the drone I'm using for my video footage and look at the difference with like a before or after. Like, you know, lots of things you can do for any niche in there. Share an in-depth review works as well. So like uh, something new came up in your industry, like I did it for like uh, Bing, I did it for Google SGE, I did it for uh, plugins on ChatGPT, I did it for like a bunch of stuff, right? That works really well as well. Like new stuff coming out, you know, make a Twitter thread with a bunch of insights. People like to reshare that. Newsworthy stuff works really well. Share an illustrated tips list. So for example, hey, here's five ways you can improve your Zumba dancing, or here's five ways you can uh, do that. And just like tweet one is maybe the hook, tweet Two is the first tip, tweet three, etc., and the call to action at the end, basically. That works really well. All like cool memes and jokes work really well. You can actually, I was just testing as you were talking earlier, now there's a meme generator in ChatGPT. Uh, so you can actually generate uh, memes uh, directly in ChatGPT and maybe some good ones would do quite well. But like, you only need to do two to four of these, like uh, to get to a million impressions per month, I only need to do that. Like two to four tweets per, per week. We're not talking, I know some people tweet all day and tweet bullshit all day, but that gets no engagement. Uh, you're better off making a few that actually have some impact. Uh, that works out better. It's like, I'm not as active anymore because mostly of the traffic problem, I find it like, I, I prefer being on YouTube now, to be honest. It's more work, but um, it's more rich. It's more engagement, like people engage more, but I definitely want to go back on Twitter a bit more to uh, get back to testing ideas. Cause I think that's what's gonna do, make us do better on YouTube basically. But overall it's a, it's a pretty cool platform to network and you get some, it, it's hard to explain the, the benefits you get from it, but it's a lot of like the benefits of knowing people in your industry basically. Yeah, it's a big, big networking element in that for sure. Yeah. Uh, okay. Let's, let's talk about the next one, which is Reddit. Uh, that was a really interesting one because it's, I feel like it's one of these kind of legacy um, websites from back in the day when StumbleUpon and Dig and all these these sites were, were kind of big. Uh, but Reddit seemed to be the one which, which stuck around. Uh, unless it closes down soon because of the API changes, because <laughs> yeah. apparently everyone's protesting but, there now. But it, I think it's it's super valuable because it's one of the few places where every, well, most people are pretty honest about what they think and feel because people hide, still hide behind usernames. Like it's not, you don't have your profile photo of you there uh, like you do on YouTube or Facebook or Twitter or these, these other places. So you don't really know who you're interacting with a lot of the time. Some famous people obviously, yeah, you know, on there as well. Uh, but because of this, if someone has a particular view about a product or service, then they're much more likely to openly and honestly express it on Reddit than they are in the comments of YouTube or Facebook or Twitter or anywhere else um, where they can be easily identified as, as, as who they are. Now this has pros and cons because you often, if you, if you don't have such a good product, um, get a lot of people talking shit about you, um, deservedly or not. Uh, but if you are, you know, one of the best products in your industry and you offer really good value and often as well, if you're a little bit more kind of quirky or alternative, like less mainstream, then people on Reddit can can often really get behind you. Um, it has this sort of um, anti-commercial vibe to it as well. At most subreddits, there will be a, a super strict, no self-promotion policy of any kind. So that's not just oh, you have to write mm. some value with it. But um, they, they'll, they'll be like, well, you just can't promote your own shit on here. Um, now, sometimes, sometimes they let you like, it, it really depends. Like some people starting on Reddit, they tend to be liked. Uh, I have an example. There's a YouTube channel called Girlfriend Reviews, where it's the girlfriend of a guy who reviews the game that her boyfriend plays. Very stupid, but it worked really well. Um, 
And it all started on Reddit. It all started from them actually just sharing what they were doing on Reddit because they were Redditors first and they were doing that. For apps as well, there's lots of apps started on Reddit where people are allowed to promote. Basically, if you're starting there, you're nobody, you haven't done anything, and then you, they see you grow within the community, people tend to be okay with that. If you are established already, you're an evil corporation, and therefore you deserve to die. Yeah, so you can, you can kind of talk about your own stuff in a more roundabout way by, you know, doing a case study of what worked for you or your your kind of journey through yeah. things. Or uh, what's what's quite popular in Reddit is this ask me anything um, thing yeah, where that a, a subreddit off. will will host. Uh, it's not even like a celebrity, you know, like the, the obituary writer in The Economist did one on, on Reddit once it got it, it did really well. Um, the, the main thing there is you need to get in touch with the, the uh, people that control each subreddit. And, you know, if you're if you have some value to offer um, that and they think it'll be a lot of people will be interested, then they, they might host that. And again, though, you have to be prepared for some pretty, I don't know, like harsh is the right word, but like direct, yeah. hard hitting <laughs> questions. Like hurt. people aren't going to fuck around and be like all cozy with you on, on, on Reddit. They'll ask you the difficult questions. So if you're cool with that, then it can be a great way to, um, you know, be transparent and offer value and, um, yeah, in, I think the, the way there. to promote your business, though, how do you promote your business? How do you drive traffic? The way you do that is you can on your profile, you can make a post that does not belong to a subreddit that you can pin on top. Right. In that post, you can say anything and be promotional. That's OK, uh, as long as it's not posted to a community. And the way you do that is you pin that post with I would propose like a lead magnet. I would say someone who builds an email list. Uh, probably it's good to do that. Pin your lead magnet on top then go and make valuable posts on these different communities without any promo, nothing. And what's going to happen is if your post gets, gets traction, people will click on your profile. And the first thing they will see is your call to action. And it's a very much like other social platforms. It's like Instagram, you know, for example. Um, and they will click. And so that's how you get conversions from Reddit without uh, getting killed completely by people. You um, make a pin post that is promotional. And you can pin a post on Twitter as well, for example. Like that's that's another way you can do this. Uh, and then you just make valuable stuff. And people that dig into you because they're interested in what you're doing, they will find that stuff and they will convert and you won't piss people off. And your organic posts will get lots of reach. So that's how you do this. Because otherwise, if you're promotional in your organic posts on Reddit, you will not get rich. Like you will get too many downvotes. You will never reach enough. Like you need to reach yeah. critical mass for these things to work. You need like hundred thousand people to see it. You know, like and then that's what's it. It's um, it's happened to us organically a couple times. Someone's asked on Reddit, you know, what do you think of Authority Hacker? Um, but I suppose you could kind of you know manipulate that in in some way as well. Um, but it, it worked. It was all our employees, really. You know. Yeah, I mean, we we, we really <laughs> haven't done much on Reddit at all, but um, it worked. Uh, for us in terms of, I mean, there were a bunch of people sort of like hating on us, hating on course creators and stuff in, in general. Uh, but there were plenty of, of you guys, I assume, who who watched this, um, you know, sticking up for us and, and kind of supporting us as, as well. And I think it was a, a relatively balanced kind of um, overview. I have, of, a of I have another tactic for Reddit as well, actually. Um, quite often, if you quote, like, for example, if in this podcast, I, I, sometimes I've done this, like, uh, if I want to get rich, I quote something happening in a subreddit. I give the subreddit some light. So I think I've mentioned the Just Start subreddit in the past, and I've seen people post about me talking about the subreddit on the subreddit, <laughs> and so that got us uh, that got us traction. So you can kind of like bait communities into talking about you by talking about them as well. Uh, that's but like you need to be of a platform for it. I feel, um, I, I, I feel like we're gonna get a lot of hate on this because like everyone thinks now it's gonna think like we're do, trying to do this no, deliberately. It, but it wasn't. Pro I, I didn't intend it at the beginning. More something that I've observed that happened, and then it just like people were like, uh, like I said, it's a good community. And it's a good community. Like there's lots of uh, people there, and it's like it's like it's free. So if you want a free community, you go check it out. Um, but like. Yeah, you can you can kind of like ego bait, and ego baiting works for everything. It works for communities, it works for websites, it works for people. Uh, saying good things about them will get them to talk about you or do something good for you, and therefore uh, you can do that. But it will work with Reddit, and it's kind of like uh, you can be you can attempt it and be sneaky, but also you can just like make a li like a list of good subreddits for your niche is a good post to have on your site, for example. Like I don't think it's a 
it's uh, it's something people will find valuable. So why not? Next one, uh, I'm gonna go quite quickly. Uh, that's Q&A sites. So I'm thinking about Quora, for example. Uh, that would be a, a good one. So Quora.com, people ask questions, people answer questions. Uh, the good thing with Quora is you can do what I call white hat parasite SEO. Uh, and the reason why is because Quora.com ranks on Google uh, for a lot of queries related to your niche. The way you find these queries is you put Quora.com in Ahrefs or the tool of your choice. You go in organic keyword and you filter for keywords related to your niche. Like for example, I put paintball in this case because we like the paintball example. The number one page that came up was, does it hurt to be hit by a paintball? Uh, and it has 1.1 thousand organic traffic according to Ahrefs. Again, take these numbers with a pinch of salt. Um, but you can, and then the top answer I think has like eight of votes or something like this. Um, so not too many. And uh, it's it's decent, but it's not very in depth. So I used AI to <laughs> make a better one. Um, and so my recommendation is use AI, but add some stuff on top. And I got a full answer in there. And you can insert your links in these answers. And it's kind of okay to do that, provided it's contextual. Uh, so for example, we had I put we put it on the screen. I'm, I generated the answer, but like I have something that says check this page out for protective gear, for example, when it talks about protecting yourself. And you could link to a best protective gear for paintball. Uh, page now it's a no follow link right so don't expect like massive boosts in rankings if you believe no followings boost your rankings yeah it's a thing but most importantly it's a way for you to appear for keywords that you might not have a chance to rank for so you are essentially hosting your content on a high uh, authority site and you're able to take bigger keywords through your answers and all you have to do is just answer all these questions again with AI not very difficult uh, and uh, you can basically piggyback ride their authority and start driving traffic to your site. Now, it's not a lot of traffic. So let's be very honest here. So I would only do this tactic for not for paintball, but for niches where leads have high value. Like if you're a financial advisor, if you are an insurance broker, if you are uh, uh, someone who sells lawyer services, if you are someone that sells leads that can be worth, like if you sell yachts or like, private jets or something like you don't need many conversions for that and and a few visits can make you lots of money and so uh, sometimes a lot of these companies that do this kind of stuff they tend to be low authority as well and that's one way to kind of like white hat parasite uh, a bigger site and drive relevant traffic back to your site through a well-crafted answer and so i would only do it in that case i don't think it's worth the effort otherwise it's too little traffic because people need to land on that page. There's lots of call to actions on Quora and other places to click you know, as a platform. Uh, so it's not gonna be that much traffic going through, but for these very high value keywords, I think there's a play to do that, especially early game. Like when you are starting, then then I would, uh, I would consider doing that. I'm sure some people are making money from that. In the fitness industry, for example, all the fitness sensors have like a bunch of links of people trying to sell their programs and coaching online, et cetera, for example. So uh, it's a, it, it's okay, but really in a few cases, otherwise don't bother, focus on your SEO instead or focus on other platforms. It's going to yield more benefits because the, there's no big upside. You can't scale like you would scale on YouTube or on Instagram or something like that. So it's really like a, a starter tactic. If you do notice people talking about you or your product on there, um, I would always, be inclined to kind of go in and, and post an on, a response, post an answer, like try and be as unbiased as you as you can when, when doing that. But um, that happened to us in the early days when we launched the authority site system. Someone asked, you know, what what do people think of this? And there were a few answers already. I went in there and, and posted, I think it was a pretty objective um, answer about why we created <laughs> you it. You can never say of, that. I mean, of course, you can never say that as the product owner. but. Um, about like, why we created it and the thinking behind it and all that kind of stuff. And you know, it did, it did, did quite well. A lot of people liked that. And it was, it was actually ranking in the SERPs for the product name for, yeah, exactly. for quite a while, which is why, you know, was, it was important it's to, to us, so, you know, like, yeah. so yeah, it's good. Um, so yeah, it's more like that. It's more like, it's definitely not a main tactic. It's really like a support thing for high value stuff. Yeah. Okay, so we'll jump into the next one real quick, which we, which is email. Now we covered email uh, a bit on this podcast before. Uh, we'll link to that here. Uh, we just did a, an episode about building your email list recently. We've done them before about um, running an email list as well. Um, but basically, uh, it's different to everything else because you have 100% control of the content. And while you are still fighting for attention, you know, in, there's many people sending emails to people's inboxes. Um, you're not 
dealing with these kind of constantly changing rules and um, you know the, the goalposts of the platform aren't moving all the time. So it's, it's because it's relatively fixed means that you can actually scale it and scale doing the same thing for uh, you know years and years and years and get really good results. Uh, whenever a business is valued, if they have a big email list, it tends to be disproportionately more valuable than if they have you know lots of followers on Instagram or any of these 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 networks because the value per email subscriber is higher because they've expressly said, hey, I'm interested in um, in your products and have accepted you sending things into their inbox for months, years, weeks, um, re repeatedly. Uh, so, you know, just very, very valuable, probably the most valuable in a per user basis of all of the, the, the things we've, we've, we've talked about. So if you're selling your own products, uh, great. But even if not, even if you are just, um, you know, in, in, in the content business, um, maybe even if you're an ad site, the, the, the numbers you need to get get um, views there probably don't make the economics of it of it work. Um, just because you know it's, it does quite get quite expensive quite quickly once you start having hundreds of thousands of uh, of email subscribers. Uh, but certainly there are many affiliate sites um, where there are is some kind of like repeat business or community where you know people are interested in coming back for more of the same. So. A bad example of that would be VPN, which we talked about earlier. People come, they buy the product, and they don't really need to know what the latest VPNs are because they're they're all pretty much the same. But if you're into you know golf or paintball, then you know you probably play that a lot. So you want to know what the latest tools or tactics or techniques or strategies are for that sport. Um, so you're like more likely to to, to want to come back. Um, in terms of how you do it, uh, build pop-ups, build lead magnets. Um, encourage people to subscribe, offer them value in terms of the content you're providing. Um, and um, think of if there's any way that you can make the, them being on the email list more valuable than just you know following you on Facebook or something. So maybe there's some unique content that, that goes there. Maybe they get early access or uh, some insights that you can't share on other platforms because of rules or restrictions or, you know. Um, yeah, you're not algorithm bound. It's really the strength of email actually yeah yeah and I, I think any anything that has a high paying offer you can do it like um don't do amazon with this but like anything that pays more than like 40 50 bucks per sell as an affiliate you can definitely do it ad sites meh i don't like it i prefer the idea of building a, a social following now like i'd rather be on pinterest for example than than be on email it's too much admin yeah and uh on products like you have to you're crazy if you don't uh, so yeah, that's pretty much uh, that's pretty much it. Uh, last one is going to be retargeting. So retargeting is basically when you uh, interact with a business either on any social platform and or on their site, and you see the ads. They follow you everywhere. You keep seeing the ad until you buy on, or until you tell them to fuck off. Uh, and uh, it works really well because these ad platforms they have so much information about you. They really know who's likely to buy, who's not likely to buy. They know how much money you make, they know where you live, they know uh, the kind of internet connection you have, they know your laptop model, they know all of that. And based on all this data, they can tell whether you can, you're the kind of person that buys this product or not because they also have the conversion data of all the other people who bought this product because the advertiser is using ads. You can use retargeting in two cases. Main case is if you have your own products. As I said earlier, we, I don't think we've ever lost money on retargeting. Uh, and, and it's it's very difficult. It works every time, basically. Or two, if you are running an email list and or maybe with high paying affair offers, but high paying affair offers, I'd rather capture the email and then sell to people after. Um, but like building an email list with retargeting, you will probably increase your, your email collection compared to just running pop-ups by like 20 to 40%, depending on how well your campaign is doing. It's gonna cost you money. Um, but hopefully you have a plan to make money with your email list if you're building it. So the idea is that economically you're spending less than you're making and it makes sense to do that. And overall, having a bigger email list will lead, lead to like better contracts for sponsorship or like will lead to more sales if you're on your own product. So uh, overall, working really well. How do you do this? Uh, for Google, for the Google side, you just need to run analytics on your side and it allows, it captures that data. For the Facebook side of things, you need to install a Facebook pixel on your site. So it's a piece of code that you can install in something like Tag Manager. 
Then uh, the next step is to create audiences. So you go into your account, both Facebook or Google, and you have an audience option for ads. And then you are saying like people who visited my site, uh, you can make multiple audiences. So you can go on Facebook up to 180 days, but I recommend you do like 180, uh, 90, 60, 30, 15. I think that's the days we have. So we can test which ones convert most uh, and see how long we want to retarget people. But we tend to retarget people for a while. Um, then you create conversion tracking. So uh, usually you just give the thank you page on your URL if you're doing an email list or thank you page on your uh, income if you are selling your product so that the platform can tell when you made a sell or you made a lead from the ads. And after that, you just create ads on, uh, for uh, the platform and then eventually it will track your conversions. It will tell you how much you pay per conversion and you will know how much an email costs you or how much a sale costs you. And based on that, you can do your little uh, accounting and tell if it was worth it or not, basically. That's pretty much the steps. Obviously, uh, there are like uh, more, <laughs> we should do a tutorial one day on how to do ads because uh, it can go a lot deeper. But overall, yeah, only run this if you have your own product or if you have a profitable email list. I wouldn't start building an email list with ads. I think it's stupid if you are not making money yet. Uh, I know some people do that, like people who have to more money than time. Um, but the problem is like, if you haven't found a way to monetize your list, you might just be building a list for nothing. And most importantly, um, if you're doing this to build an email list, I don't like the idea of building just an email list based on that. I like to at least at best is like to have to build the audience for the ads based on the people who bought the product I'm selling. Therefore, you need some conversions before to feed that data to the ad platform so it targets better. Um, at worst, the people who have already opted into your email list, you can actually use that conversion data to create the audience in the ad platform. So you need some kind of base of an email list first uh, and you need to get going before you do that. So don't do it first, but once you have let's say a hundred sales maybe for whatever you're selling, then you can start doing it and you'll do quite okay. So that's pretty much it. Do we want to talk about SEO? I, I want to just do a final conclusion on SEO saying that SEO, as I said in the beginning of the podcast, is still, in my opinion, the best traffic source. And even if traffic dropped by 50% tomorrow, I would still think it would be our main focus because it's so good um, because of the intent that people have, because of the volume of traffic that there is. And uh, yeah, it's like buying intent it, um, is, is, yeah. is often like much stronger there for, for certain queries, obviously, than it, than it is, you know, uh, it's more targeted, at least than, than a You're lot of You're saying you want to buy social. something. Yeah. It's like yeah. when you say that, it's like it's so much stronger than someone. If you even browse something or something, yeah. like you say you want it right now. It's the timing that matters, too. Right. It's like you might be the audience that's interested in type of product, but you, you might not be interested right now. Whereas when you Google it. You know, you, you estimate that you have the money available to pay for it. Uh, you estimate that you have that need right now and all these things that social platforms can't do nearly as well. And therefore, uh, SEO, in my opinion, is still the strongest, but we still recommend you explore maybe one or two of the ones that we mentioned today with, in my opinion, a strong point on maybe YouTube, uh, LinkedIn, if it applies to your niche, Pinterest, definitely. Uh, and Facebook is a decent traffic driver these days. So that would be my, my top four. Which one are, are your favorite? Um, so I think it really depends on the type of business you are. Um, I think you have to be careful with things like YouTube because you're you're locking yourself into a kind of lifetime um, agreement to, to create content there. Otherwise, it just, just cuts it all off. Um, so, you know, I, would, I wouldn't be so quick to just jump into it, especially if it's, you know, early days of your your business or, or your website. Um, the other ones which you can, you know, utilize your free content to then repurpose for these other platforms with a bit of extra work and customization and tweaks. Um, I think, you know, Twitter, obviously, when you have ideas, you test them out there, you use that as the basis for then deciding what you want to make short videos from that's like kind of all the rage right now. So, um, you know, Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, shorts you know to, to an extent you could argue as well facebook as well um but then you know it's like well if you're on facebook with these videos then we might as well do the page and do this as well if you're on youtube you might as well do the longer videos and that's why so you're kind of doing a bit of everything actually. exactly yeah. it's a bit of a it's like the thin end of a wedge that you know you just there's not like the, the networks you focus on and then the ones that are just kind of like back you're up recycling on. the content yeah. Yeah, no, you just recycle, you know, like the, like we're not really pushing Instagram very hard, but we're just recycling tweets on it, for example, things like yeah. that. Like, uh, so it's like, it's more like that. It's, but, uh, and I think overall, like 
just having your brand present on all these things is just like a, a fair brand signal. It's like, I, I don't think it's going to prevent you from being killed by core updates if the rest of your site is trash. Um, but I think that these are the kind of things that Google wants you to, to, to be, to see, to interact with people, create some content there and act like a normal brand would. And uh, it's, it's really about these 8020s. It's really about using AI. Actually, go and check my video on uh, AI automation because I talk about automatically creating social updates for your content on your site, for example. It does a pretty good job. I talk about automatically creating your newsletters and all of that. It does a really good job. The newsletter I made in this video, I was quite shocked at how good it was, actually. Um, and so, yeah, go check that video. The other side forgot. Um, and, uh, and yeah, but anyway, this podcast has been pretty long, so I think we're going to wrap it up now. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Don't forget to subscribe, like, and we will see you uh, next week with something that on YouTube. It's going to be a video. See you.